I'm delighted and honoured to introduce Professor David Nutt, who's giving tonight's President's Lecture. David has a long and distinguished career. He's worked in many places, including Oxford, America, Bristol, and now Imperial College in London. He's done groundbreaking research into neuropsychopharmacology, and he's held many leadership positions. He's edited the Journal of Psychopharmacology for over 25 years, and he acts as a psychiatry drugs advisor to the BNF. He's published over 500 original research papers, and a similar number of reviews and book chapters, eight government reports on drugs, and 31 books, including one for the general public, Drugs Without the Hot Air, which won a prize for communication of ideas. He gives regular talks to the public, and my son once attended a music festival just to hear him. I think it's fair to say that David is no stranger to controversy. Tonight's lecture covers a difficult area where the college is currently considering its position, and I look forward to hearing what he has to say. As always, we encourage you to tweet, but this is um, a sensitive area for some, so please tweet responsibly. Um, I don't know what we'll do if you don't tweet responsibly. <laughs> please try to. And I hope you will stay after the talk for refreshments. We usually provide crisps, but today, in keeping with tonight's subject, we will have chocolate brownies. And over to I'm going to sit the audience. Unadulterated chocolate brownies. Oh, totally unadulterated. Maybe just kind of a dial, I'm not sure. Well, it's, it's, it's great to be here. Um, it, uh, it was a few couple of years ago, I think three years ago, I talked about uh, the psychedelic revolution in psychiatry. That's still going on, but uh, cannabis is catching up, which is why I've uh, chosen this title today. And of course, cannabis has in some ways been more controversial, particularly for psychiatry than, uh, than uh, even psychedelics. And it's a very challenging subject to talk about. Um, this was when I went public from my, uh, my position. So this is a little warning for Owen, who's in the audience, who's now chair of the ACMD. Um, I was sacked from that position, um, largely for saying that cannabis, which is, you can see the book of cannabis falling from my grasp. Uh, the cannabis was less harmful than beer and fags. And, uh, that was something the government didn't want to hear. They really did not want to, to know that, the truth about uh, cannabis. Uh, so they thought by sacking me, they shut me up. I mean, it, it just shows how little research they did. But anyway, <laughs> well, at the time, I was pretty sure I was right. We'd done three reviews of cannabis for the ACMD. Probably about three and a half thousand papers we reviewed. We were pretty sure we knew what we were talking about. But uh, now I know I'm right, because uh, we've now had confirmation from the, the world's most important authority in the field of cannabis, a man called Obama. And this is a really remarkable statement. Um, and you need to understand why he said it. He, at the time Obama made this statement, uh, 200 million Americans and zero Brits had access to medical marijuana. But it was then and still is. It's illegal under federal law. So you need to be very careful if. Well, you don't, because you're all very old, but your kids, when your kids go to America in the summer, they mustn't smoke dope on federal land. It's still illegal on federal land. And it's a seven year sentence, almost inevitably. But outside the federal uh, areas, it, it's, in many states it's now legal, and in more states, over half states, it's uh, a medicine. But because it's illegal, and still is, the federal uh, drug enforcement agents, the DEA, or the feds, they were smashing up and destroying pharmacies that were uh, making the medicine available to Americans. And Obama said, this is really rather stupid, isn't it? You know, the decision has been made, it is a medicine, and we are not going to impose uh, an outdated historic ban on those states that are using it as a medicine. So he said, we're not going to prosecute people selling medical cannabis anymore because it's less harmful than alcohol. He actually went on to make an even more remarkable state, which is harder to justify, which is particularly for the adolescent brain. And he may well be right, but we can't, uh, we can't be certain on that yet. And that was the first time an American president had ever told the truth about drugs. Uh, and it was really important, not just for that reason, but also because up to that point, America had persisted in arguing and persuading the rest of the world that cannabis really was very dangerous. And it kept haranguing countries which had gone along with the American states in making cannabis uh, a medicine, trying to get them to backtrack. And it certainly put a lot of pressure on us not to change our law. But since now, uh, we've, uh, America can't control its own people. 
It really has no legitimate authority over the rest of us. So, in theory, we could do what we liked here without having to count out to them. And although it took us, it's taken us a couple of years to finally wake up to that fact, and we're slowly moving in that direction. So, my talk today, I've got to, a number of points I want to I want to get across because until you, unless you understand the origins uh, of cannabis and the way in which the laws developed, you won't really understand why we are where we are now. So I'm going to start at the very beginning, take you through history, culture, uh, some science, some politics, and then in the end come up with some uh, what I believe are appropriate responses to both medical cannabis and also recreational cannabis. So I think the first established religion in the world was Hinduism. Uh, Hinduism emerged in part from the visions and experiences produced by this drug called Soma. And this wasn't the Soma that uh, was uh, used uh, by Huxley in Brave New World. This was a, a proper drug. This was a cocktail of probably of cannabis, magic mushroom juice, and ephedra, or cat. And, uh, it was hugely influential, it certainly gave people visions, otherwise we wouldn't see these multi-armed creatures, I wouldn't imagine. And, uh, and cannabis is still used today, so it's been used for about 4,000 years in religious ceremonies. There are some Indians, uh, sadhus, who use it on a regular daily basis as part of their religious rituals. Uh, and twice a year, on special days, Indians partake of cannabis as part of their religious ritual, particularly on the holy day. And there they drink cannabis milkshakes. Cannabis isn't water soluble, but if you shake it up with milk, there's enough fatty milk for the THC to get into the fat and be drunk. So it's got a very, very long tradition in terms of uh, Eastern mysticism and religion. The first known influence on, on Western culture was Dutch school of painters, uh, uh, including, of course, Rembrandt. And they used cannabis to improve their ability to understand depth perception and colour discrimination. And there is a, a rather beautiful picture of uh, the Philosopher's Lair by Rembrandt, which I think gives you an, uh, an inkling into the kind of uh, uh, effects that cannabis had on him and helped him really become a better painter. And of course it's rather nice, it's a, it's a philosopher's uh, Lair, because of course, the philosopher, you look very closely into that, you'll see the philosopher was also a scientist. And of course, more widely known is the fact that cannabis led to jazz. And it was the widespread use of cannabis by jazz musicians in the 1920s, which actually allowed jazz to start. Because it's actually a very difficult time when you're stoned to play normal musical notation. <laughs> so they just started to syncopate, and from that came a whole class of music, despite the huge efforts of uh, the American government and the feds to get rid of and to eliminate and prosecute uh, famous jazz musicians such as Armstrong. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, the music survived and it's directly attributable to cannabis changing the way people thought about playing music. But of course we're mostly interested in cannabis as a medicine and it's almost certainly the world's oldest medicine. There's a Siberian princess, she died of breast cancer and it is presumed from the archaeological analysis of her tomb that she smoked cannabis to ease her pain. So it's been used for many millennia. Uh, the Chinese had a little pictogram for it. It was used as a medicine in still is a medicine in Chinese medicines and also in Indian medicine. So, uh, as I say, <laughs> arguably the world's oldest continuously used medicine. The first record in Britain is this one. This is a rather fun report. There's Robert Hooke, president of the Royal Society, commenting on the emergence of this drug bang into scientific consciousness. And I'm not going to read it all out. The, the original transcript on the left, there's a, a modernized transcript on the right. And if you read it, whatever line you read, you'll find some of it. It's right. It talks about the psychological effects not only on the user, but also on the person who's engaging with the user. And from that time on, cannabis slowly emerged into the UK as a medicine. 
And there were a large number of cannabis products available in the 1800s. Over-the-counter products, which people could use for a variety of ailments. And uh, as you probably gather from what you read in the media today, cannabis pretty much treats anything. So it was a very good seller. <laughs> and we believe that it was used by Queen Victoria. Uh, her physician, the Queen's physician, was a, a great advocate of cannabis, and he wrote the, the definitive treatise in the 1800s on the therapeutic benefits of cannabis and also the harms of cannabis. And Victoria used it for period pains, and she used it for the pains of childbirth. And when I'm feeling very mischievous, I wonder whether the reason she had so many kids was that they had some interesting parties in Balmoral, but I'm not sure about that. And in fact, it was a medicine in Britain until 1971, uh, when it was banned. It was banned on, on the pretext that it was being misused. Two GPs in Ladbroke Grove, I don't know, are there of them here? <laughs> but anyway, they were prescribing it uh, and <coughs> suggesting to their patients that they use it recreationally. They were prescribing tincture of cannabis, which is cannabis in an alcohol solution, and suggesting to the patients they should drop it onto uh, <coughs> tobacco and, uh, and smoke it. Here's one of them. Here's one. I'm not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. Tincture. And the interesting thing about it is that. Uh, Yes, it, it, unquestionably, the real harm that the GPs were doing was encouraging people to smoke cigarettes, <coughs> not to smoke the cannabis. But anyway, that was the justification of banning it, and I'll explain a bit later the real reason we banned it. But cannabis is also, all, really since we've had uh, a knowledge of uh, its role in public life, it's always been a very challenging drug to some forms of authority. So Islam tried to ban it, having banned alcohol, when cannabis became more widely used in about the 12th century, it tried to ban cannabis. Uh, and it also tried to ban tobacco. It, 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 it's failed on all three. We know from the WHO reports that in, in Morocco, which is a, a country where certainly alcohol and cannabis are banned, we know that 3.2% of the Moroccan population are alcohol dependent, 2.7% are cannabis dependent which is actually a rather low level considering the quality of cannabis that they grow in Morocco. But anyway, put that to one side. Um, <laughs> banning it doesn't work. People still use it. People like to use it. But in terms of us as UK citizens and psychiatrists, the first time it got into properly into uh, our consciousness was in the 1890s with the Indian Hemp Commission. Now, it's, it's generally not known that uh, some of the great establishments in Britain were built on the money made by the East India Company. And they made their money in a number of ways, but one of them was selling cannabis to the Indians. And the other, of course, was selling opium to the Chinese. And we had a, the, it, the Indians were quite happy to grow their own, cannabis goes wild in India, but we banned the use of local cannabis and we forced them to buy our cannabis so we could take the proceeds back to build great institutions like the university that I work at, Imperial College. So the British, government in the 1800s was the largest drug uh, pushing a, uh, organization the world has ever known. And much of the, uh, the empire was built on the wealth uh, of selling cannabis. But there were concerns. There were concerns by prohibitionists, people who were worried about the drugs, alcohol, and as well as cannabis. And they were concerned that we were driving the poor Indians into a state of uh, dependence and also chronic intoxication. And so, a man called Mr. Kane asked the House of Commons to do, amongst other things, investigate the desirability of prohibiting the plant. And that was when the Indian Hemp Commission was set up. And there you can see the front page of the, uh, of the commission report. And the conclusions of the report were very clear. The moderate use of hemp drugs produces no injurious effects on the mind and produces no moral injury, by which they mean it doesn't cause dependence or addiction. But, hell, you know, who, who would trust a British commission? You know, well, certainly not the Americans. And the attack on cannabis persisted. And there were four major pillars in the prohibitionist uh, armory. The first was the 19th century, the temperance movements, the Puritans. There was a very, very strong move uh, to eliminate the use of all drugs. Uh, and in fact, it was quite successful. 
effectively, eventually, in fact, all drugs got eliminated, including alcohol in America and Norway and Sweden. But that was the problem, because the elimination of alcohol in 1920, I think it was 1922 in America, made people realize that they actually liked drugs. And the campaign to get alcohol reinstated, of course, created an enormous problem. It, it, it fueled the growth of the mafia. It corrupted every policeman in America so that there were no police that could be trusted. And that led to the American government setting up a separate police force, which we now call the Drug Enforcement Agency, uh, the untouchables, the people that were uncorruptible. And they were pretty uncorruptible. They did quite a good job in, in destroying uh, secret stills, destroying speakeasies that were serving alcohol. And they were headed up, and they were formed and headed up by a man called Harry Anslinger. And uh, he became the second most famous man in America, actually. More famous than the president, second only to the head of the FBI, Hoover. And I'll come to how that's important in the next slide. There's also political expediency, and the history of cannabis and the attacks on people who use cannabis is a, a terrifying litany of political expediency and the corruption of science for political ends. And there's also commercial interests. <coughs> the alcohol industry has been extremely influential since it was re-established in the 1933 in the States in trying to wipe out all opposition. And quite a lot of the anti-cannabis uh, uh, hostility, the, the, the campaigns to in states which are voting to legalize or liberalize cannabis laws are quite a lot of the anti-cannabis media is funded by the American drinks industry. And there's also the pharmaceutical companies, and the pharmaceutical companies uh, started to emerge in about the 1820s, when they realized it, they, the, the plant-based medical products could be simplified into single uh, uh, com uh, components. So for instance, you could take out of the opium, of the opium poppy, you could take out morphine, and you could sell morphine as a drug, and, you, and that gave you some commercial advantage because you could potentially patent it. And then, of course, you could make derivatives of morphine like codeine and heroin, which you certainly could patent. So there's a strong move back in the 1800s to get rid of plant products because there's the, the commercial value of the pure extracts was much greater. And the pharmaceutical industry still today is arguing strongly that the only way we should use any kind of plant-derived drug is in by extracting and purifying the, the uh, affected ingredient. And in the case of cannabis, that's impossible, which is one of the reasons we have uh, a, a relatively limited research in this field. <laughs> Let me just get back to American Prohibition. There's Harry Anslinger. Uh, and in 1933, confronted with the reality that he was going to lose his men, his 35,000 army, they were going to be made unemployed if alcohol was legal. He decided to do what? A lot of people have done, including uh, the new president. He decided to create a scare from Mexico <laughs> and a scare about drugs. So it wasn't, uh, Trump isn't the first person to make Americans, or to try to get Americans worried about Mexicans bringing drugs into the country, contaminating their youth, upsetting the balance of power. And he changed the name of cannabis to marijuana, to, so you could, it was more obviously associated with Mexicans. And this wonderful, now historically ridiculous, but at the time kind of terrifying specter of crazed Mexicans bringing their drug and crazy making young American men, or in the case of most of the pictures, young American women uh, with not much clothes on, crazed. And this relationship, you know, the, 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 it's the way all drugs get banned. It's, a, it's a, basically, if you put drugs and sex together, then the people who vote want them banned. And it was very successful. Cannabis was banned. He kept the DEA going. And it was a very, very effective way of maintaining his power and his control. Everyone kind of knew the ban was stupid, but they didn't do much about it. The real problem came in 1961 when the United Nations decided to codify international, the international regulations on drugs. 
And the Americans at that time didn't want to impose their ban on cannabis across the world. But there was an American, sorry, there was an Egyptian doctor who was absolutely convinced that cannabis caused psychosis and that the mental hospitals in Egypt were full of people who were using cannabis. And he campaigned strongly to get cannabis made illegal under the first UN convention. And the US didn't want it, but the Egyptian government wanted it, and the US wanted air bases in Egypt, so a deal was done. They had their air bases, and cannabis was made illegal. Not much happened really for the next seven years, but then what really changed things was the 1968 uh, Nixon war on drugs. Now, when Nixon was setting up for re-election, he was facing problems. The war in Vietnam was going very badly, uh, and he felt he was going to lose the election. <laughs> so he had to find something to take the American people's attention away from Vietnam onto him as the great leader and the man that was going to save them from problems. And his advisor, John Ehrlichman, decided that they would wage a war on drug users. And you have to read this because this still, we're still living with this approach to drugs and drug control today. The Nixon 1968 campaign had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either anti, I bet they thought they'd try, but, <laughs> but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Fantastic campaign. He won every state except Maine, just by scaring people about blacks and hippies through the use of drugs. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. But that doesn't matter, because he got elected. And the truth is, the British government has known it's been lying about cannabis pretty much ever since. And certainly in the 2000s, when we decided to wage a war um, young black men in London uh, using cannabis, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And the problem with lies, the problem with lies is, as Darwin pointed out a long time ago, false facts are very injurious to science, for they injure long. And perhaps more psychologically aware, Mark Twain said, how easy it is to make people believe in a lie, and how hard it is to undo that. And I will argue and hopefully convince you that almost everything that you've learned about cannabis in your <coughs> lifetime has been a lie. I'm not suggesting you're going to change, but at least I give you a chance to think about it. The first thing is the idea that prohibition works. Cannabis wasn't the first drug to be prohibited. By the time cannabis was prohibited in 1934 in America, we already knew that prohibition was a bad thing because the first ban was on opium with the Hague Convention. So you stop Chinese people smoking opium because you don't like Chinese people. It's a good vote winner. You know, they're nasty immigrants, you know. It's, it's funny how the, the narrative hasn't changed in a hundred years, hasn't it? What happens? You stop people smoking opium? Well, they start injecting morphine or heroin, you know. That's one. Ethanol prohibition. People started drinking hooch and methanol, going blind. So we know, we know in 1934, we knew that prohibition didn't work, but and Singer brought it in. But we have carried on. We have carried on doing it. Even though we knew that prohibition didn't work, we, kept, we carried on prohibiting cannabis, so we got skunk, and subsequently synthetics like spice. And of course, there are other examples subsequently. I mean, the drug policy in this country for the last 100 years has been based on completely flawed policies. And it's not that we haven't told the government. It's just that they haven't listened. Now, we were inter but it was interesting. The two things we'd stood up to the Americans on, we carried on prescri allowing prescribable heroin. The, the Americans thought that if you stopped doctors prescribing heroin as a medicine, people would stop using heroin as a recreational drug. I mean, how absurd is that? But they actually imprisoned doctors who were prescribing heroin to heroin addicts in the 40s. They put doctors in prison for treating their patients in the way they'd previously been treated before they banned heroin. We carried on using heroin, we still do. We're one of the few countries in the world that's actually uh, 
ex pursued a rational approach to heroin as a medicine. And we carried on using cannabis as a medicine until 1971. But the Americans pressurized us and pressurized us and pressurized us until in 1971 when we brought in the new Misuse of Drugs Act. We made it illegal. On the pretext that doctors were misusing it, but with the reality because the Americans wanted us to. And every single, every single drug in our Misuse of Drugs Act that has been banned until two years ago was banned because the Americans told us to. The things were happening internationally, and in 2000, the House of Lords wrote a report, and that was when I first got interested in this. I gave evidence to that, to that uh, House of Lords committee. And they wrote a report on medical cannabis. It's a remarkable report. It stood the test of time. You read it today, it's as accurate as it was 20 years ago. It's a beautiful report. And it said a number of things, and it said the first thing we should do is change the legal status of cannabis so people can research it because it probably is a medicine, and, and people can research it if it's put in Schedule 1, which says it has no medical use. So for those of you who don't understand what Schedule 1 means, Schedule 1 means drugs in Schedule 1 are drugs which are very dangerous, drugs like crack cocaine, and have no medical use, drugs like cannabis. And uh, if you want to research cannabis, uh, as I do, I have to get a special license, a special police check, and uh, pay quite a lot of money to to be able to do this. Hospitals and universities in Britain are exempt from needing licenses for other schedules, Schedule 2 and 3. So I prescribe heroin uh, for research, uh, and give heroin to patients in research, but I have to have a special police check to hold or use cannabis, because I might be dealing it. I mean, it is absurd, but that's the way the current act is uh, written. And actually, it's not just written. That's the way the act is prosecuted. But Tony Blair was quite sympathetic to the, that uh, initial House of Lords. But as I say, it was a, it's a brilliant report. It's a, it's a landmark in rational attitude to cannabis. And David Blunkett, the Home Secretary at the time, was sympathetic to it. So he, he thought, at the time, cannabis was controlled either as a Class A drug, if it was a liquid, in Class B, if it was a, a resin or, or a flower. And a review was instigated by the ACMD. I was part of that review. And we uh, recommended that all forms of cannabis be removed from class B to class A or B to class C. And that happened. And um, the remarkable thing was that the month before it happened, it happened at the end of January, the whole of that January when it happened in 2005, the media, certainly some aspects of the media, the Mail and the Express and the Telegraph, they went ape. They created hysteria about the revision downgrading of the uh, classification of cannabis. And, uh, but it still happened, but they carried on, and the battle to regrade it continued in incessantly until eventually it was regraded uh, by, uh, by Jackie Smith, uh, as I'll show you. And, and the reason for the change in attitude to cannabis was partly the Americans told Blair off for being soft on cannabis. And partly because, particularly Brown, realised there was some political expediency, some political value in being hard on cannabis and cannabis users. And you remember that, uh, you probably all, like I, thought that uh, when Brown took over from Blair, we were going to open up a new chapter in reason and rationality, and he'd been so good at the economy, good at running the country. Didn't any of you remember that? Those, those few weeks when we thought there was hope? Yeah, you remember that? Yeah. I remember it vividly. It didn't last very long. But there, Brown was a, a very anxious man. He was very worried that he might lose the election to, to Cameron because he didn't call an election soon enough. If he called an election as soon as he'd taken over from Blair, he would have won, but he was cautious. And then slowly Cameron began to use his charm and his, uh, his way with words to persuade the British public that the future was Tory. And Brown thought he was going to lose the 2010 election. Uh, and he tried to get support from the right-wing press. Now, he couldn't go to the Murdoch press, credit to him, he'd fallen out with Murdoch, and like Blair, who got into bed with him. So he had to find another right-wing newspaper. And the, the Barty brothers wouldn't speak to him because they live on Sark and they never speak to anyone. So he went to speak, off the record, to the Daily Mail. Now, Prime Minister's code, ministerial code, says you cannot Prime Ministers are not allowed to have off-the-record meetings with anyone, certainly not 
the editors of Macbeth. said he did, so he probably did. And there are no records of it, it's not in his biography. But it is alleged that Mr. Brown asked Paul Dacre, the editor of the Daily Mail, would the Mail support Labour in the 2010 election? Uh, it's a kind of weird thing, isn't it? Because the Mail used to support Hitler, but I guess since, um, <laughs> since Brown was more like Stalin, he thought there was probably, you know, he couldn't tell the difference. Yes. And, um, <laughs> and Dacre allegedly said, yes, the Mail will support you if you do three things. You reduce the top rate of income tax from 50% to 45%, Check. That happened within a month of the meeting. Put a cap on immigration of 200,000 a year. Check. That was the labor policy. And reclassify cannabis from C to B. And none of us knew this. I didn't learn about this meeting till three years after I was sacked. But then it all made sense because at the time of the meeting, soon after the meeting, Gordon Brown started making pronouncements about cannabis. And I remember, I was in the Home Office, and uh, the Secretariat came over and said, look, look what he's saying. He was saying, skunk is lethal. And I'm saying, who told him to say that? And we had no idea, we had no idea. What does he know about skunk? Yeah. And uh, he knew nothing about skunk, of course, because he isn't. But the, the point is, he's not to pronounce, and we couldn't understand why he was suddenly getting hard on cannabis. And it's because <laughs> he promised the Daily Mail he would. And of course, the really absurd thing was, did the Mail support him in the election? So, not a wise man, Gordon. So the soul of the Labour Party, and still not get elected. Yeah. But the attack on cannabis was manifest by uh, the police being given a priority to arrest. It was a police target to arrest people and convict them of cannabis possession. So we ended up generating a million young people with cannabis convictions. And that's a huge problem. If you create an underclass at three times in dawn raids, if they rang the bell, she'd open it for them. She can't jump out the window. She's in a wheelchair. They know that. She knows that. But, you know, if you get up at three in the morning, uh, put on a military outfit and smash a door down, you get quite a lot of overtime. It's also quite fun for some policemen. And uh, it's a really difficult problem for her now, because if she's convicted again, she'll go to prison, because the fourth strike, you must go to prison. So her life is in the hands of the police. As a taxpayer, I think that is a atrocious waste of my tax money. And uh, I'm sure Queen Victoria would not have been amused by that either. Mm -hmm. There's one other aspect of the whole story that most of you will never have heard about. But this, I think, the most egregious of all. This, this, it's how the government forced the law lords to abolish one of the great pillars of British justice, which is the, mil which is the medical defence. <coughs> In 2005, the law lords decided that for cannabis only, the defense of necessity was no longer allowed. So let me explain the defense of necessity to you. It's a, embedded in English common law that if you have to commit a crime to protect yourself from a greater harm, you can plead the defense of necessity. And what was happening was that patients, like that patient, when they were getting arrested for cannabis possession, they were saying, I had to break the law, because they did have to break the law, to protect me from the harm of my illness. In quite a few cases, we're going through the courts. And Brown did not like that. So the law lords were asked to review it. And the law lords said that the defense of necessity did not apply to cannabis. It still applies. So if you're caught with crack cocaine for your headaches, that's fine. You can use that defense. The only drug you're debarred from using in the medical defense is cannabis. So if you're caught, you're convicted. And any magistrates here? Magistrates hate this, for the, so they have no power. If someone is taken to a magistrate's court because the police have found them in possession of cannabis, they are convicted. There's no defense. You can mitigate your sentence based on the need, but there is, you cannot not to be convicted. So as I say, magistrates hated it. A lot of police hated it as well because, the, because they realized that they were the sole arbiters of, uh, of whether someone was, was right, in the right or wrong. It was an outrageous decision. Under the Proceeds of Crime Act, you can have assets. He said, the way it works is this. So this poor lady in a wheelchair, they go in and they smash a door down. You're smoking cannabis. She says, yes, yeah. 
Where'd you get it? And oh, usually the partner says, I got it for them. Don't blame her, it's my fault. And they say, well, isn't that convenient? Because you're a dealer. So if she got it, it was seven years for possession. You're a dealer, that's 14 years. And because you're a dealer, we can freeze your assets over the proceeds of crime tax. And you can have your assets frozen because you can't. Your banks closed, your credit cards are closed. You go bankrupt effectively for months. It was a horrifically evil approach to criminalizing people who were helping sick people deal with a problem that the medical profession wasn't being able to help them. Now, the three Lord Lords that uh, came up with the decision to abolish this centuries old defense were Lords Bingham, Carswell, and Roger. And the way the reason they did it was this the court was influenced by the government's refusal to relax the legislation in this context, despite recommendations to do so by the House of Lords Selectmen. So the House of Lords said, ease the regulations, the government refused. So our, our supposed independent judiciary said, well, if the government is right for the government, it's all right for us. So there's the idea that there is, uh, the judiciary has some kind of integrity beyond governments is completely distorted by this rationale for banning the medical defense. But what's even worse is this, so be, but before Bingham was made a law lord, he said this. A certain Boris Johnson asked him the question, so you would legalize cannabis? And Bingham said, absolutely, it's a stupid having a law which isn't doing what it's there for. And you find that chilling. As soon as you become a law lord, you end up denying your beliefs of just a few months before, simply because the government has promoted you. There's Alan Johnson, the man in me. There's me in the spliff, you can see, it's my moustache. The other people in the spliff are the scientists on the ACMD resigned when I was sacked. And when I was sacked, um, the argument that Johnson made, with made three arguments. He said, cannabis causes schizophrenia, it damages driving, and skunk is very dangerous. The remarkable statement, I, I watched the debate in the House, so the, the Lib Dems were very supportive, and they... And Chris Hoon uh, actually led the, 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 the debate, arguing that it was wrong to have sacked me. And Alan Johnson said, whoa, nuts a legalizer. I'm not, as you'll see at the end. Uh, and moreover, he's been telling us for years that cannabis doesn't cause schizophrenia. When last week, the governor of Pentonville Prison told me it did. <laughs> but there you go, you know, three and a half thousand papers over Ten years, but one prison governor knows better. Yeah. We don't need we don't need experts, do we? You know, they, that's where they got the idea from. It. The remarkable thing about cannabis is the social change in uh, use that's occurred in my lifetime. So, it, when I first went to university back in 1969, half a million British people had used cannabis. Study it's increased now to over 10 million. So we've had a 20-fold increase in the number of users in the last 50 years, which probably equates to a hundred-fold increase in the amount used. So you think if cannabis was actually doing any harm, it would really have been obvious. Um, and it's not very obvious, is it? Really? I mean, it's not killing people. That is, uh, it's, uh, I don't know, it's just, you get the odd smell around the town, but you don't get much here. Does it affect driving? Well, the government's own report showed that the effect of cannabis, which is the bottom uh, point, the effect of cannabis on driving is to double the risk, and the effect of alcohol is to give you an eight-fold increase in risk. So, yeah, it probably affects driving a little bit, but it's way less harmful than alcohol, on a two-together additive. So then the really, the one thing that the government was hung on to was schizophrenia. And we were fascinated by this question, because you think a 20-fold increase in the number of users even though schizophrenia is rare, do you think there'll be some increase in the number of people who are psychotic or schizophrenic? So, um, Martin Frischer, who's a, a very good epidemiologist from Kiel, went through the experts, looked at diagnoses. Incidence prevalence of psychosis at the top and schizophrenia at the bottom over the period when this massive increase in use might have led to an increase in number of people with the diagnoses. And there's no increase if anything's going down. And, uh, in fact, the only study in the world, was, which is the uh, Swedish conscript study of 19, the 1957 cohort, uh, the Anderson paper, the only study that has ever actually said that cannabis causes schizophrenia. If you take, the date, take that data from that paper, we estimate you've got to stop 5,000 young men, 7,000 young women 
from smoking cannabis to stop one case of schizophrenia. Now, that is not a tractable public health problem. A number needed to treat a 5,000, you know, come on. That's ridiculous. And also to try to treat it through prohibition and criminalization of users is even, is even more insane. But so we said there's no need to reclassify. This is, a, this is just a smoke screen. But it was, up, it was upgraded from C to B. At the time, Jackie Smith said, public opinion, policing priorities, and precaution. I have to say, those are very poor justifications for overturning the known science. And the problem we have is psychiatrists, and I guess, like, anyone here not a psychiatrist? Okay, some of you are not, but most of us are psychiatrists. And this is the problem we have. That basically, our patients have become the collateral damage, or actually, I think the targets of a war on cannabis. The government wants to believe that cannabis causes schizophrenia. Our patients have got schizophrenia, and they're therefore in the front line. There's also this sort of subtext of violence as well. And I think that's outrageous. I think, I mean, I, the idea that you blame patients for using a drug that makes them ill when it doesn't make them ill, I just think it's indefensible. And that's kind of why I was sent. Yet, we have this conundrum that many of our patients use it. In fact, probably the majority of our patients use cannabis now. Why is that? Well, one argument is that some of them are dependent. And, and, and it's true, some people will, some of our patients will be dependent on cannabis. Many of them are using it for self-medication. They use it to overcome some of the adverse effects of their antipsychotics. And some of them are probably self-medicating their illness. And I'll explain that later. One of the things I did when I was uh, working on the ACMD and subsequently was to do the most systematic analysis of the harms of drugs that had ever been done. We looked at uh, 20 drugs and we measured them across 16 independent parameters of harm. And it turned out that cannabis was about in the middle there. Uh, alcohol was the most harmful drug in the UK. The size of the blue bar is the harm of the drug to the user and the size of the red bar is the harm of the drug to society. <coughs> So cannabis is certainly not the least harmful drug, but it's way less harmful than alcohol. And I just want to make that comparison in detail between the harms of alcohol and the harms of cannabis. There are 16 ways in which drugs can do harm. There are nine harms that drugs can do to people who use drugs, the users. And here they are, here are the nine harms. They can kill you, they can, the drugs can kill you directly or they can kill you indirectly, etc., etc. And yet the scores there are ratios uh, of the, the, uh, basically ratios of a hundred, so a fraction of a hundred. And what you see there is that only for one measure, dependence, are alcohol and cannabis equal. On every other measure, cannabis is less harmful than alcohol. So that's to users. If we look to society, to other people, there is no measure that of cannabis that is greater for cannabis than for alcohol. Now, obviously, that's confounded by the fact that more people use alcohol than cannabis. But if you put it together, overall, cannabis in the UK today is a third as harmful as alcohol. So how we deal with the harms of cannabis uh, is really the key question. And I'm going to explain to you now how what we've done has been exactly the wrong thing. Everything we have done as a government has confounded the harm. And it starts from the fact that Cannabis is a complex plant. It makes many, many substances. But the two which we know most about are these two. Delta-9 THC, the stoning agent, and cannabidiol, which is kind of anti-stoning agent, which is anxiolytic, it's antipsychotic, and it may have improved memory. And they have kind of opposite effects. They don't directly work on the same receptors, but cannabidiol is a kind of antidote to Delta-9 THC. And what has happened, as we have systematically tried to eliminate access to cannabis from countries like Morocco and Lebanon, which made cannabis which had a mixture of THC and CBD, is that we've eliminated CBD. So we've eliminated the good bit, and we've maximized the bad bit. Why is that? Because, as I showed you, prohibition always tends to lead to people making more potent substances because it's, you get more bang for your buck. And homegrown cannabis now is largely 
just THC. And here you see what's changed over the last uh, 15 years or so, the rising amounts of high THC skunk uh, and the lower the reduced amounts of cannabidiol or strains of, of cannabidiol. And in fact, the current data is that 95% of cannabis bought in the UK is skunk. Well, okay, skunk is stronger. Maybe you take less of it. But the reality is, even if you take less of it, you still don't have the balancing out CBD. And we have known, this is the work of Val Curran at UCL, we've known for 10 years now that skunk is bad or worse for you than a herbal mixture. You get more psychotic symptoms with skunk. You get more memory impairment with skunk. So why didn't we set up a policy to get rid of skunk? No, why not? Because we kind of thought, well, if we keep crushing down on cannabis production and use, we'll get rid of everything. But in fact, we haven't. We've just <laughs> created uh, a monster of skunk. And we did that in the face of knowledge that the Dutch had succeeded 20 years before. We knew we could do it if we did what they did. But we didn't want to do it because the Americans wouldn't let us, because we were too scared and the Daily Mail didn't like it, etc. So we carried on crashing down on cannabis use. In fact, we even created a worse problem, because for some reason, probably related to the sort of masochistic, or sadistic rather, ten, well, maybe it's both masochistic and sadistic tendencies of our politicians, we started punishing people who tested positive for cannabis, especially prisoners. And for reasons which are not really clear, it was decided, perhaps because a politician had interest in a, a drug testing company, I don't know, we decided to start testing prisoners for cannabis. Cannabis hangs around in the, the body for longer than any other drug. You can test positive for cannabis three weeks after a split. So we were testing prisoners and uh, taking away their remission. So we're, a prisoner aren't stupid. You're going to make them stay a third longer in prison for smoking a joint. They're not going to smoke a joint. What are they going to do? Well, if they get a chance, they'll take heroin. Which of course, they get a lot of chances too. But they also discovered that there were forms of cannabis that were synthetic and couldn't be tested for. So we created the spice epidemic by punishing prisoners again in prison. And this has truly been the a nightmare, because there's probably tens of thousands of different forms of spice. And many of these are very, very, very potent. So you, know, you can get taken hundreds of pounds worth of spice on the back of an envelope. You just soak the envelope in spice water. Now we've got up to 90% of inmates in some of our open prisons using spice. 5% of our prison officers are now drug mules. The profit for, for get spice is so much easier to get into prisons than heroin, so now it's the main market. We had nine, 70 deaths last year in prisons from spice. Never had a death from cannabis in prisons. But this hatred we have of people using cannabis has just created this real monster, and this is truly the most terrifying one of all. And uh, what did the government do? Well, it carried on doing what it's always done, which is the irrational approach. So it decided, with Spice, it decided to ban the first generation. The first generation of synthetic cannabinoids were actually being tested in humans. They were made to be alternatives to cannabis. They were given to human volunteers back in the 70s. The volunteers said, that is the most disgusting thing I've ever had, I'll never take that again. Not a single one of them got on the market as a drug. But at least they've been tested in humans. But then they got banned, and then, so people just moved to the second generation. The second generation had been tested in animals, didn't kill animals, but... When, they gave, when humans started using them, they were even more unpleasant and uh, toxic. So we banned those. And then we got the third generation banned. And these are drugs which have never been tested. We don't even know if they're cannabinoids. We just know that people are selling them, using them, and dying with them. But they've never been tested even in a rat. So humans, this is the first, you know, this is the unusual period in life, human life when the first people testing drugs are human beings who are just trying to escape being prosecuted for using that cannabis. It's kind of weird. I mean, I feel sometimes like we're in a sort of swifty and dystopian kind of world. And what we know is if, if you get people access to cannabis, they don't use spice. Don't want to, don't need to. 
you want to read more about it, you can. I put up this article in the Lancet for the last year. I mean, it's the attempt to ban spice has now led us to banning hundreds of thousands of compounds, or potentially banning them. It could be medicines. Indomethacin and several statins will be illegal under the current spice laws. They're not actually been enacted yet because the Home Office has at last worked out the fact that this is not a good thing. Destroying the whole of the pharmaceutical industry in a completely pointless attempt to stop people using spice. They're not going to stop using it. So, and also, the other thing is that there is, one, there is no spice antidote, but one possible antidote is, the, is a drug called THCV. This is another, another, another component of the cannabis plant. And in, in its uh, lack of wisdom, the government decided last year to keep THCV illegal, even though there's no evidence it's, it's got psychotic properties or even addictive properties. So the only possible spice antidote is still illegal for reasons which are completely illogical, and I, I don't understand them. And it gets worse. The Psychoactive Substances Act wasn't actually about psychoactive substances. It was about banning head shops. People didn't like head shops. Head shops were the new sex shops. Well, we know what happened when we banned sex shops. People just went on the internet and got much, much, much worse kinds of porn. We got rid of head shops. Well, we didn't, actually. Most head shops are still there. They just sell paraphernalia. They don't sell drugs. But the drugs are sold behind the back of the head shops. Before the head shops were closed, they were selling weak stimulants, like called bubbles or sparkle, which is largely things like methylpropamine, pretty innocuous. You know. A gram of methylpropamine is like, like three expressives. Now, around the back of the head shops, they don't sell methylpropamine at all. No, they sell spice. Because it's much more potent, it's much cheaper to make, and it kills you, or it zonks you out like that poor man sitting there in Manchester. So, I don't suppose I need to say any more how we, we have continually and utterly pursued exactly wrong policies in terms of cannabis purpose. Just a few words about cannabis in the brain. This is truly one of the most remarkable. I, at least once a week, a journalist rings me up and says, another paper showing that cannabis damages the brain more. I don't know if it does or not. Is that cannabis? No, I think it's alcohol, isn't it, in the case of Homer, but... Um, <laughs> cannabis does affect the brain, there's no doubt. Here's a paper of ours which is coming out uh, next month. And this is a, com a paper comparing skunk, pure THC, with a mixture of THC and cannabidiol. And Basically, look at the right-hand images, there's, a, there's a sort of three images of the brain from three different perspectives. Look at the top right-hand image up there. And red is where skunk is different. The, effect, the brain is differentially affected by skunk compared with placebo and not affected by the balance mixture. And though that circuit there, that is part of what we call the salience network. So this is one of... Uh, the first studies really have shown that skunk has quite clearly different effects in the brain, as well as different effects on the psychology of memory and uh, psychosis, etc. And uh, here, is, uh, here you see another way of looking at that data. The green is the skunk. Skunk has a profound effect to disrupt the network uh, of brain functioning, which focuses around the insula, which is one of the most important emotional centers of the brain. So physiologically, skunk is different, as of course we all would have imagined. But very difficult to do these studies because, because of the illegality, and that's why it's taken a long time for any research on, on the differences between skunk and herbal to come out. Cannabis might change the brain. Here's a, well, one of the rather better studies looking at the effects of long-term cannabis use, changing the density, slight reduction in volume of the orbitofrontal cortex. You know, that'll be used to justify putting people in prison in America for the rest of their lives because, you know, it's a, it's a dangerous drug. But the reality is, the drug that really damages the brain is alcohol. Now, you know, you can look at that brain, those brains there, they look pretty normal. That one, there's a kind of an aggregate. Alcohol is the only drug we know categorically damages the brain. Those are four patients from one of my research projects. And those brains were as damaged as the brains of people with Alzheimer's. There's no question alcohol damages the brain. There is serious doubts to whether any other drug. Even strong high doses of crystal meth really damage the brain. So alcohol, if we care about brain function, probably about 20% of all dementias are due to alcohol. And then you see these wonderful findings, and you know, these are the things that really challenge me. So this paper was published showing there's an increase in orbitofrontal connectivity, despite the fact that it's shrunk. Now that's interpreted by the writers of the paper. There's gonna be impaired decision-making 
But you could equally well interpret it as it's going to improve their creativity. And in fact, of course, when we talk to our patients who use cannabis, who are schizophrenic and use cannabis, why? It's just because they can think sometimes differently. Instead of getting locked into this complete rumination about the, the voices or their paranoia, even though that might get worse when they smoke cannabis, they can appreciate more of the world. And that's the problem, possibly, because you increase frontal activity like this. But every, every almost every paper that's published on the effects of cannabis in the brain always has a negative perspective on it. And some of you may have heard this. There was a lot of hysteria a couple of years ago from the, this was from the uh, Dunedin study, show, or was the Christchurch study, showing that supposedly that cannabis use impairs IQ. Well, it was possible subsequently to review the, that data in a British study, the Alspach study in Bristol. And the answer is that there's very little relationship between uh, occasional cannabis use and exam results. And of course, we should have guessed that because David Cameron was uh, a cannabis user at Eton and he still got to Oxford and all And the real problem for me as a scientist working in this field is that the the illegal status, the Schedule One status of cannabis is hugely destructive to research. I've already explained how I needed special police checks to even be able to research it. And so the reality is that because it's so difficult to do, people don't do the research. Because they don't do the research, people say, well, there's no, benefit, there's no health benefits, there's nothing proven. And of course, they exaggerate the harms to justify keeping it in Schedule One. So we have this vicious circle of prohibition. And that, that, that is anti-scientific. I mean, to be fair, internationally, it's just as bad. But the, most of the research on drugs and, has, uh, is funded to find harms, not to find benefits. And many of the harms are exaggerated or distorted. Which is unfortunate with cannabis because there are probably at least 100 separate components of the plant which could have medicinal value. It could be a treasure chest of important medicines. But very, very difficult. So how can we begin to restore reason? Well, the first thing is that the Dutch have done it for 40 years. The Dutch realized that cannabis wasn't harmful. They called it a soft drug. They allowed it to be sold in coffee shops. And the main reason they did that was to separate the cannabis market from the heroin and the cocaine market. And it succeeded brilliantly. They almost, their young people pretty much stopped using heroin. They could go and get their cannabis without ever meeting a heroin dealer. Fantastically successful. They also yeah. have medicinal cannabis. The US, Israel, Canada, Uruguay, Germany, and now we have, they have medical cannabis, and a number have <coughs> recreational cannabis. And the reason we have resisted medical cannabis until last year was because every drugs minister has said, this is just a ploy to get recreational cannabis. If we give it out as a medicine, it'll slip into the black market and be used recreationally. Which is kind of pretty implausible because we have about the highest use of cannabis in the world, even though it's illegal. And we, I think our market's saturated, and it's, it's pretty hard to see how there will be any slippage. And even if there were, is that justified making patients suffer because we might start one or two people using it? It's ridiculous. And perhaps the most remarkable thing is that the change in the law in this country has been driven by mothers. Three mothers of children with severe epilepsy, as Billy called, were the first one, have had to live overseas for a year to prove that their children can live a normal life if they're given cannabis medicines. I just thought, I mean, they have to go overseas and live overseas because British doctors won't do it, British government won't allow it, because we just won't face the truth. I think it's outrageous. It's outrageous we have to leave it to the parents to make these decisions. But worse than that, I think how many other people might have survived? 300 people a year in Britain with epilepsy die of seizures. How many of those could be saved if they'd been on a cannabis medication? No one knows. We'll probably never know because the current way in which we're allowing cannabis to be used means that probably most people with epilepsy will never get exposed to it. And it's... We now for cannabis, anti-nausea, anabolic appetite stimulation, for pain, muscle spasms. And there are many, many potential uses. Uh, the ones in red are the ones that are of relevance to psychiatry, sleep, PTSD, Tourette's, 
ADHD and schizophrenia. The German government has uh, made 57 indications acceptable for medical cannabis treatment and has made it compulsory that that treatment is reimbursed by insurance companies. I kind of think, well, given a choice, I wouldn't, wouldn't worry about being treated in Germany, would you? Is, their medicine's not so much behind ours, is it? It's quite likely it's ahead of ours. <laughs> so cannabis for adult ADHD? Well, here, British study. Bill Asherson, is he here? So the first study looking at cannabis mixture, CBD and THC for adult ADHD. And it improves the hyperactivity and attention. But isn't being used at present. And of course, this is the most interesting of all, because the, the same, very same people, the very same groups, schizophrenia research groups at the Institute of Psychiatry, who've been uh, pursuing the role of certainly THC and, and presumably skunk and spice in cannabis, have also discovered that cannabidiol is a useful adjunctive treatment. And here you see that, that, that uh, the different symptom profiles which are reduced by adding cannabidiol to ongoing therapy. And this is really the, the, the truly greatest public health problem that we have seen in relation to cannabis. It, we've actually, because we believe it causes schizophrenia, we've kind of we've made the cannabis that our patients can get the form that is most likely to cause schizophrenia. We've kind of proved our point to the detriment of our patients because we've eliminated CBD. So let me just say a few things a bit more about cannabis and schizophrenia because I guess most of you probably worry most about this. So the first thing to say is that cannabis intoxication is the nearest any of you are going to get problem. It's a model of schizophrenia. We've shown that ketamine and psilocybin, psychedelics, are slightly better models, but they're all three pretty good models. So if you want to know what it's like, particularly to be paranoid, get very stoned. But the, the, after that, don't answer any questions about whether you've ever been paranoid because you'll be diagnosed as psychotic. We know that balanced herbal mixtures don't appear to increase the risk of schizophrenia. They may accelerate the onset of cases which would happen anyway. Skunk, and particularly synthetics, spice, they may lead to a schizophrenic form. I don't believe they cause schizophrenia. I believe they may, again, accelerate the development of it. I think they may also produce a kind of, a, they might distort the normal form of schizophrenia to make it slightly different, but nevertheless still very unpleasant. We also know that cannabis makes positive symptoms worse. And the reason psychiatrists are very worried about cannabis and schizophrenia is because the truth is that's all we care about. We only really care about positive symptoms because we know what to do. We just give them more dopamine blockers. If people are using cannabis to reduce negative symptoms, well, that doesn't really come into our thinking, does it? How many of you actually ask your patients why do you use cannabis rather than just tell them off? And this policy of t testing and interdiction has just created this monster, the monster of skunk and now the monster of spice. And the other thing is, we really should have a CB1 receptor antagonist to help deal with the problems. And I, I wrote to the health secretary when he was Jeremy Hunt a couple of years ago and said there, there actually are a number of potent CB1 antagonists which have been invented and made. And they've been discarded because they were developed to treat schizophrenia and they developed to treat weight gain. Could we resurrect them? And he said, we don't do that. The Department of Health doesn't invent drugs. That's the pharmaceutical industry. There's not a lot of interest in the pharmaceutical industry in resurrecting drugs for treating psychosis induced by cannabis or spice. There's not really a market. And there's no guarantee that they might even get on the market. And uh, we have in the audience John Strang, who's battled for, what, 20 years, John, to get naloxone available? Can we, do we really want to wait 20 years to get the CV1 antagonist available when it's there? But the, with the Department of Health not showing any interest, it's very difficult to go for. And then finally, I want to finish by talking about recreational use, because it's, as I say, it's very, very common in Britain, and they are, particularly young people, are using the worst forms of cannabis. So how can we deal with that? 
Well, I set up this charity called Drug Science, which you've probably heard of, and we, we did the multi-criteria decision analysis on the harms of drugs. And about four years ago, we were approached by the Norwegian government, MRC, the Norwegian MRC, and asked if we could do something even more challenging, rather than estimate the harms of drugs, estimate the value of interventions or different forms of policy. So we did it, and, and it turned out to be extraordinarily challenging and, and also very interesting. And here are the 27 criteria that we had to consider when we're looking at different forms of policy. The impacts are on health, on social factors, on political factors, on public factors, on crime, economic factors, and costs. So that's a really 27 variables. We were tough enough doing 16 variables for the harms. We couldn't, we had to define all what these variables meant, and then we had to create scenarios uh, ranging from complete prohibition to complete and utter free market to evaluate the impact of these different policies on those 27 uh, measures of harm or benefit. We did it, we could only do it for three drugs, and we did it particularly in relation, relevant today, we did it for cannabis and alcohol. So here are the results, published just uh, last year. And this shows you the, the size of the bar, shows you the benefit to society, or the least harm. So the taller the bar, the better the policy. And you can see that for cannabis, the second bar in, state control, a regulated market for cannabis, such as happens in Canada, such as happens in Uruguay, we estimated is the best solution. It's better than the free markets, which is one the sort of thing that is happening in Colorado, and it's better than decriminalization, and way, way better than absolute prohibition, which is the bottom right hand line. Interestingly, the same is true for alcohol. A regulated market, such as they have in Sweden, is a better market than the free market that we have, or other forms of market. So we now have a policy approach which you can justify. A regulated cannabis market is, is the most logical, based not only on experience of Holland and other countries, but also now on a, this very detailed analysis. And we do need to change, because the black market kills. Uh, I'm going to finish with this rather sad story. So this young man, uh, he goes to score some cannabis down the road in Canterbury. Oh no, he's living in Maidstone. He died in 2016, but it took a year for, to get the coroner's report. And uh, his dealer says, hey, I've got some nice E. Would you like some E? And he says, yeah, sure. And he takes the E. And he goes home, and he takes the E. And he dies, because it's not E, it's fentanyl. And we don't know whether the dealer knew it was fentanyl. We don't know if the person who sold it to the dealer knew it was fentanyl. <laughs> what we do know is that fentanyl is killing a lot of people. 20,000 in America last year. 100 or so in Britain. Fentanyl is cheap as chips. And if it's sold as anything, then it's going to kill you. And that's why we shouldn't have a black market. If Robert could go and get his cannabis from a coffee shop, he'd still be alive. <coughs> A couple of years ago, we worked with the Lib Dems. They asked us to do a report on uh, the possibility of a recreational regulated market. We produced this report, and that's now Lib Dem policy. So it's the first, uh, first party, apart from the Greens, to endorse uh, a regulated, sensible market in cannabis. And for you as psychiatrists, how can we reduce the risks of harms to our patients, uh, the psychiatric harms, if they're using cannabis for other indications, such as medical indications. Well, the first thing is we should always be trying to get the best medical benefit with a minimal amount of THC, because it's THC that certainly can make you paranoid. So we need products that have a range of THC concentration. Just to talk about Billy Caldwell. So Billy Caldwell, 2,000 seizures a month, reduced to about two a day, just by cannabidiol but adding just a little bit of THC, a couple of little more. Now, we don't see if it was a cannabis extract, it could have been the THCP, but you can get enormous benefits with even legal drugs like cannabidiol, but you've got further benefits by having the plant product. We should always try to have cannabidiol present in our uh, products. We should make THCV available as a, a potential Can you say treatment. a bit more, because it's legal cannabidiol, you can walk into shops and buy Yeah, sure, well, should we take that in the questions? Okay. Yeah. You're allowed to ask questions, and I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. 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 And also, and this is of course the more challenging one. Um, 
we should try to educate other doctors uh, and other medical professionals about cannabis dependence. And it would be good if, if we could minimize cannabis being used inappropriately in people already dependent on it. But on the other hand, it might be that prescribed cannabis is going to be better for them than skunk or spice. So I'll finish with this quote from uh, one of the greatest uh, musicians in history, Bob Marley, herb is the healing of the nation and alcohol is the destruction. And I kind of, having spent many Friday, happy Friday nights in Amsterdam, I certainly prefer that to Bristol, and uh, you all know the reason why. <laughs> so I'm going to finish now. If, uh, if you're interested in reading a bit more about the history there and the biology, it's in my book, Drugs Out for Hot Air. All the proceeds go to my charity, Drug Science. And if you buy it for your kids, I think it's so cool. Uh, I'll sign it next time you see you. Thank you very much. <laughs>